So hello, everybody. Hey, Catherine. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, JP. Uh, so thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, just doing some technical things here on the Facebook side, making sure it's working. There we are. Awesome. All right, and we have a couple people who've joined us already. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hello. Uh, so, just so everybody is aware, um, my name is Catherine. I'm from the Thompson Nicola Regional Library System. I'm the Adult Services Coordinator. And I'll give you a quick overview of how things are going to run tonight, seeing that it's a little bit different from some of the things we've done before. Um, so, if you haven't ever been into one of our virtual events so far, some things that you should know is that we are on about a 20 to 30 second delay um, from what you are seeing on Facebook. So if you type a question into the chat section and then it takes us a little while to get to it, uh, that's most likely just because the internet is waiting to catch up with us. Um, just a couple other things. Um, this event is being recorded. So if you have to leave or you miss part of it, there will be, it will be posted on the Thompson Nicola Regional Library Facebook page after the event, so you can watch it anytime. And it will also be available on the Camus Society for the Written Arts Facebook page as well. We'll also be putting it up onto our YouTube channels when we can. So I believe without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to our Camus Society for the Written Arts partner, JP Baker, uh, who's going to help us host the event. Hello, JP. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Cheryl. And hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, and, and I'd like to welcome you all as well. Um, Kamloops Society for the Written Arts is so happy to, uh, to partner with the TNR Library on, on events like this. Um, and this is part of uh, what we call cool people talking about cool ideas. That's our whole push with these author talks. Uh, and so we're super happy to present some, some really interesting people. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered virtually here, uh, at least those of us appearing on screen, uh, on the traditional and unceded territory of the Sequetmic people. Uh, and it's an honor to be meeting and learning and sharing uh, and writing and reading on this territory. Um, so I just want to tell you a little bit about Cheryl before I turn it over to her. Cheryl uh, grew up in South Africa and she moved to Canada in 2006 with her husband and son. They lived in the lower mainland of BC until 2017. Um, Cheryl worked for a long time as a graphic designer and photographer and artist, obviously a very creative person. And then she dedicated herself full time to writing in 2014. Um, she's written nonfiction as well as fiction. Um, in the fiction side of things, she's written uh, two science fiction novels, We Are Mars and Storm at Dawn, which are part of her Rubicon saga. And she's uh, just putting the final touches, I believe, on Break the Dark, which is part three of those chronicles. Um, so yeah, so, so Cheryl may talk a little more about those things. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Cheryl uh, and welcome you. And thank you so much for being here. Thanks, JP. Um, it's really great to be here. Thanks, everybody, for having me. And um, before I get started, as JP said, I've, I've written two science fiction stories. Before that, I didn't really write a lot of science fiction or anything like that, but I've been a lifelong fan. So um, without further ado, I will get into my reading, which is an excerpt from 1984, written by George Orwell. It's from part three, chapter three. And um, just to give you a little bit of a background on it, it's a very dystopian story written in 1949. And at this point in the story, the main character, Winston, has been um, arrested and he is in interrogation, tormenting, being tormented by his, his interrogator. <clears throat> Winston shrank back upon the bed. Whatever he said, the swift answer crushed him like a bludgeon. And yet he knew, he knew that he was in the right. The belief that nothing exists outside your own mind, surely there must be some way of demonstrating it was false. Had it not been exposed long ago as a fallacy? There was even a name for it, which he had forgotten. A faint smile twitched the corners of O'Brien's mouth as he looked down at him. I told you, Winston, he said, that metaphysics is not your strong point. The word you're trying to think of is solipsism. But you're mistaken. 
This isn't solipsism. Collective solipsism, if you like. But that is a different thing. In fact, the opposite thing. All this is a digression, he added in a different tone. The real power, the power we have to fight for night and day, is not the power over things, but over men. He paused and for a moment assumed again his air of a schoolmaster questioning a promising pupil. How does one man assert his power over another, Winston? Winston thought. By making him suffer, he said. Exactly, by making him suffer. Obedience is not enough. Unless he is suffering, how can you be sure that he is obeying your will and not his own? Power is in inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them back together again in new shapes of your own choosing. Do you begin to see then what kind of world we are creating? It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery is torment. A world of trampling and being trampled upon. A world which will grow not less but more merciless as it refines itself. Progress in our world will be a progress towards more pain. The old civilization claimed that they were founded on love or justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. In our world, there'll be no emotions except fear, rage, triumph, and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. Everything. Already we are breaking down the habits of thought which have survived from before the revolution. We have cut the links between child and parent and between man and man and between man and woman. No one dares trust a wife or a child or a friend any longer. But in the future, there'll be no wives and no friends. Children will be taken from their mothers at birth as one takes eggs from a hen. The sex instinct will be eradicated. Procreation will be an annual formality like the renewal of a ration card. We shall abolish the orgasm. Our neurologists are at work upon it now. There will be no loyalty except loyalty towards the party. There will be no love except the love of Big Brother. There will be no laughter except the laugh of triumph over a defeated enemy. There will be no art, no literature, no science. When we're omnipotent, we shall have no more need of science. There will be no distinction between beauty and ugliness. There will be no curiosity, no enjoyment of the process of life. All competing pleasures will be destroyed. But always, and do not forget this, Winston, always there will be the intoxication of power, constantly increasing and constantly growing subtler. Always at every moment, there will be the thrill of victory, then the sensation of trampling on an enemy who is helpless. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. So some of my reasons for choosing this reading from 1984 are, um, in a list of things I've got here, one, in his own words, Orwell explained in 1984, he based the story chiefly on communism because that was the dominant form of totalitarianism at the time. But I was trying chiefly to imagine what communism would be like if it were firmly rooted in the English speaking countries and was no longer a mere extension of the Russian foreign office. My second reason for choosing 1984 is it profoundly affects society or it affected society in his day and it's given us terms and big ideas related to those terms for instance big brother the term double think thought crime the concept of two plus two must equal five mass surveillance and the violations of freedoms of expression my third reason is orwell builds a an entire world within 1984 he imagines every aspect of what life would be like under this communist, this uh, totalitarianism. The focus in every detail is what makes the story quite frightening. Orwell introduces the telescreen as an important technological device, and he modeled it on previous um, knowledge of television concepts at the time. Um, in 1949, TVs were not in common use. Um, but in his book, 
the devices are ubiquitous. They're glaring from every corner of every room, in the home, in the workplace, on the streets. To um, make some comparisons, a, a book written a few years earlier in the 1930s called A Brave New World by Aldous Huxley um, shows the difference between a utopic and a dystopic um, story. 1984 is very, very much a dystopia, whereas Huxley's A Brave New World was meant to show a utopia, the extreme of what that would look like. Journalist Christopher Hitchens noted the difference between the two texts in his introduction to an article named Why Americans Are Not Taught History. I'm just going to take a small excerpt from that. Orwell's 1984 was a house of horrors. He seemed to strain credulity because he posited a regime that would be go to any lengths to own and possess history, to rewrite and construct it, and to inculcate it by means of coercion. Whereas Huxley rightly foresaw that any such regime could break because it could not bend. In 1988, the Soviet Union scrapped its official history curriculum and announced that a newly authorized version was somewhere in the works. This was the precise moment when the regime conceded to its own extinction. For true blissed out and vacant servitude though, you need an otherwise sophisticated society where no serious history is thought, or, sorry, is taught and thought, I would think as well. Uh, a second excerpt is from social critic Neil Postman, Postman, sorry, who contrasted the worlds of 1984 and Brave New World in a foreword of a book called Amazing Ourselves to Death. He writes, what Orwell feared was those who would ban books. What Huxley feared was that there would be no reason to ban a book. There would be no one who wanted to read them. Orwell feared those who would deprive us of information. Huxley feared those who would give us so much that we would be reduced to passivity and egoism. Orwell feared the truth would be concealed from us. Huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance. Orwell feared we would become a captive culture. Huxley feared we would become a, a trivial culture. As Huxley remarked in Brave New World Revisited, the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions. So we'll, we'll get into all of that a little later uh, during the Q&A. Um, right now I want to move on to why I chose science fiction and society, how to, why I chose to put the two of them together um, and how science fiction influences society even today. It can usually be described, science fiction can usually be described as such because it touches on at least one of these major elements, technology, futurism, scientific discovery, time travel, alien life, and space travel. There's, there's a couple of other things as well that you can add to that. Um, other elements include cultural and societal commentary, usually from that extreme point of view, dystopia versus utopia, um, and fictional world building. Uh, there's a lot of science fiction that's completely created in its own world. Think of Star Wars, for example. In The Time Machine, H.G. Wells explores both the concept of utopia and dystopia. In the world, his time traveler visits far into Earth's future. He touches on communism and on a hedonistic nihilism as themes as well as giving us his interpretation of the theory of evolution in his creatures and settings. H.G. Wells was very fascinated with evolution. He followed Darwin's theories very closely. To unpack and examine every element of science fiction would be very time consuming. So I'm going to focus mostly on technology, the inspiration for science and space discoveries and exploration and societal and cultural commentary. I'm including that third element, the commentary, because I think it has specific relevance to our current um, situation with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's, it feels a bit like a dystopia. So 
Anyway, let me start with how science fiction is a major driver of technological advancement. And it's, it's responsible for a lot of forward thinking inventions within our time. Uh, the handheld mobile telephone was invented by Dr. Martin Cooper, who cited the communicator in Star Trek. I have like a little communicator in Star Trek as his inspiration for the phone. It took him only 90 days to develop his first prototype in 1973. Then Arthur C. Clarke described in 1945 how radio signals could be bounced off satellites for long distance communications. His thinking preempted not only the satellites that would um, be the communications network of the future, but the rockets that would get them into those orbits. Uh, something a little fun, Dick Tracy's video wristwatch bears some resemblance to today's smartwatches. And while we're watching our watches, we can contemplate a near future where driverless cars will be ubiquitous on our roadways with some versions in testing in the last 10 years or so already. Um, the futuristic kit from Knight Rider, um, TV's Knight Rider, doesn't seem as far-fetched now when you compare it to the Tesla driverless vehicles that they're testing. Apart from some of the more fantastical features that help him to evade or to give chase. And then there's a little bit of a cold chill when we think about and realize Hell 9000 consciously refused to obey Dave's commands in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Arthur C. Clarke imagined a time when computers would seize control and think for themselves. Today, artificial learn intelligence is learning at a vast, uh, an accelerated rate and it's scooping up huge amounts of data and analyzing it as we pour it into the internet, in, onto the World Wide Web every day. That AI is learning everything about humans, everything about how we conduct our lives. So it's something to think about. Um, it is a fact that technology companies routinely employ people they call futurists. Um, who use science fiction to explore the potential of technological development. This is actually called science fiction prototyping. So there's all these companies that do this. Um, and I think there's some negative trade-offs that we can all agree on. Things like the, the it makes the world easier to manipulate. Social media, we've already seen in the last couple of years how easy it is to manipulate the message via social media. Everything is a little less private. Uh, we see a lot of privacy breaches. We've just seen a huge Twitter hack in this last week where main accounts were, like the big celebrity accounts were hacked and all of their private direct messages were stolen. So the mass surveillance through facial recognition and tracking apps is also proving to be a privacy situation that's gonna probably develop. Um, and it's becoming a lot more dangerous uh, Virtual currency is almost untrackable. Spyware and ransomware are landing up on computers every day around the world. Hand in hand with technology, we can look back on the history of space exploration and many scientific breakthroughs as being possible through the prediction or imagination of things in science fiction. The Time Machine by H.G. Wells explores an attempt to make sense of the theory of time travel, a theory that has fascinated physicists through the 20th and into the 21st century. Then Jules Verne imagined a submersible ship in his, called the Nautilus, in, in his book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was written in 1860, 70, somewhere there. And it was decades um, before modern submarines cruised the seas and oceans of the world and were much closer in the way they were designed and built than the submersibles at the time Verne wrote his book. And we've got Isaac Asimov to thank for the term robotics and the three laws of robotics, which provide a framework for researchers and scientists who develop robotic systems, including AI. Um, many modern inventions can trace their origins to science fiction creators and our drive to be an extra, extra planetary species is also in some ways thanks to science fiction. 
H.G. Wells gave us the War of the Worlds and introduced us to aliens from Mars, which allegedly terrified listeners when Orson Welles adapted it for radio in 1938. But it also planted a seed of inquiry. What was Mars really like? Was there life on Mars? And what about the moon? Modern space exploration draws some of its inspiration from the enthusiasm and imagination of people like Carl Sagan, Douglas Adams, who wrote Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, Frank Herbert, Isaac Asimov, Arthur C. Clarke, George Lucas, and Gene Roddenberry. Humans want to boldly go, and science fiction has demonstrated our insatiable thirst to explore what lies beyond. In more recent science fiction literature, Andy Weir's The Martian seems to have ignited a zeal for Mars-focused science and research, and the pioneering spirits of people like Elon Musk, who has his sights set firmly on Mars, is driving a new space age. Just this month, there, were, there are three spacecraft taken off from Mars. Earlier this week, the United Arab Emirates successfully launched the Mars Hope mission, which is going to be an orbiting probe. NASA's Mars Rover, the Perseverance, good name for 2020's um, rover, is leaving imminently, and as is China's Tianwen mission. In fact, I think that one leaves either tonight or tomorrow. And that one is quite ambitious because it's going to include an orbiting probe and a lander craft. So as a species, we once again are bound for the stars. And as we look to the heavens, including the newly discovered Neowise comet, I hope some of you have actually managed to get a chance to have a look at it. It's beautiful. Um, we ponder the existence of, uh, well, we ponder existential questions about life here on Earth and beyond. Science fiction attempts to imagine the answers to some of the more enduring questions we ask as a species. Are we alone in the universe? Could dinosaurs be brought back to life? Should we play God creating monsters, robots and intelligent machines? And could we survive an apocalypse or an invasion or a pandemic? Stories and personalities which come, which come to mind that touch on these big um, questions include Carl Sagan. Um, Cosmos is only a small fraction of his body of work. He was very influential in a lot of um, work to do with SETI. Ray Bradbury, Philip K. Dick, um, Melissa Matheson's screenplay for E.T., The Extraterrestrial, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Asimov's robot series, including iRobot, Alex Garland's brilliant movie, Ex Machina, Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park, Timeline and the Andromeda Strain, Robin Cook's Outbreak, Dean Kuntz's The Eyes of Darkness, written back in the 1980s, and of course, Station Eleven by Emily St. Jean Mandel. All of these brilliant people and many more. I mean, this is just scratching the surface. They imagined works around some of the most enigmatic questions we have today. There's a deep body of works, which when, when one begins to really dive in, those in this list represent a tiny fraction of what humanity has offered in terms of out there thinking. So can you imagine what all of these creators would have thought of 2020? the year our world turned into a dystopian science fiction novel as we battled COVID-19 and the unstable and economic climate it has created. There's some comfort in reading some of these stories, however. They explore our, our responses to fear by crisis or fear created by crisis, sorry. Some of them even show humanity overcoming or surviving the deadly threats in the stories and what effect that has on the characters. My first book, We Are Mars, has a viral outbreak as one of the central themes, and I explored what it would be like to face a fast-moving biological threat in a, an isolated environment with time running out. The characters are tested to their limits, and as they battle to contain the threat, they ultimately win out, and they get to look back and say, we beat this thing. And this is what science fiction can really be good at. 
Look at Star Trek, for instance. The stories have a built-in optimism. The characters always come out on top. Even when their futures appear broken and upended and a little bit hazy, the heroes and heroines survive. They endure, they persist, and eventually reach a new equilibrium. In the current crisis, we see no end to the trouble and the confusion. There seems nothing more fearful than the invisible threat of a deadly illness, which seems unstoppable. But we can take heart and seek solace and a sense of hope by distracting ourselves with similar tales from science fiction. And there's a resurgence in popularity of stories like Outbreak and The Eyes of Darkness because they offer insight, a way forward, heroes and villains, and most importantly, a tangible outcome. Our world seems more dystopian and unreal at the moment, and science fiction resonates with us on a personal level in these dark times. It is a genre with something for everyone. For me, it's Star Trek. I've been a Trekkie since I was old enough to walk and seeking comfort in the escapism of that science fiction world is something we can all relate to presently. This brings me to another point on cultural impact of sci-fi. The fans. The burgeoning fandom around stories like Star Trek, like Star Wars and many other science fiction brands is driven by a sense of unity, of likeness and camaraderie. Cosplayers, fans, enthusiasts, collectors alike endless, have an endless enthusiasm for their particular brand or favorite brand of science fiction. If you take a look at the number of comic cons and fan cons that are put on every year, with this year being the exception, um, it increases all the time. People have an immense ap appetite for these immersive experiences, which makes them feel as if they're part of something bigger than themselves. They're accepted and celebrated for their enthusiasm and expression of originality within a fandom that, you know, it's, it's a safe environment. Science fiction gives us a glimpse of the future possibilities and cool gadgets like lightsabers, androids, hoverboards, the idea of flying across galaxies or moving back in time or forward in time, or maybe even discovering a higher plane of existence. Science fiction brings the past, the present and the future together in endless possibilities. It's like the Lego of storytelling genres. You can put the elements together in infinite configurations and still create something original, exciting and inviting. I'd like to end today with a reading from Jules Verne's Journey to the Center of the Earth. Um, I chose this because I really enjoy the descriptive nature of Jules Verne's writing. Um, in this part, he's actually discovering, his discoverers are finding the center of the world. A new mayor in Turnham. At first, I could hardly see anything. My eyes unaccustomed to the light, quickly closed. When I was able to reopen them, I stood more stupefied than surprised. The sea, I cried. Yes, my uncle replied, the Lidenbrock Sea, and I don't imagine there's any other explorer who will ever dispute my, my claim to the name, my claim to name it after myself as its first discoverer. A vast sheet of water, the star start of a lake or an ocean, spread far beyond what the eye could see. The deeply indented shoreline was lined with a stretch of fine, shining sand, softly lapped by the waves and strewn with small shells which had been inhabited by the earliest creatures of creation. The waves broke on the shore with a hollow echoing murmur peculiar to vast enclosed spaces. A light foam blew over the waves on the breath of a moderate breeze, and some of the spray fell on my face. On the other edge of the slightly sloping shore, about a hundred fathoms from the waves, was a huge wall of vast cliffs rising majestically to a great height. Some of these, dividing the beach with their sharp spurs, formed capes and promontories, worn away by the ceaseless action of the surf. Farther on, the eye could discern this massive outline sharply defined against the distant hazy horizon. It was certainly a real ocean with the irregularities of shoreline on the earth, but deserted and horribly wild in appearance. 
And that's it for me. Thank you very much. JP, back to you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. That's that's it's amazing to get that 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 overview of the uh, <laughs> sci-fi in you. I mean, it's 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 great for me because you you bring up books that that I haven't read for quite a while. You know, like uh, as a kid, particularly Jules Verne was dear to my heart. Jim Center of the Earth, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Um, those were amazing books, and so to hear them discussed, I haven't I haven't thought of them in a while. So it's it's great. Um, so we are going to take questions here. Um, there's a couple of different ways to give your questions. I know we have some Facebook viewers, so you can put your questions in the Facebook um, comments and we might see them, catch them on a little bit of delay, but feel free to put them there and we'll get them. Um, if you're joining us on Zoom, you can put your questions in chat. Uh, and we'll find them there. Um, <clears throat> while we wait for some questions, I do have some questions, Cheryl, if you don't mind. No worries. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the pandemic, um, mm. strange, strange times. Do you ever look around and think, you know, if I wrote this, nobody would believe it. Nobody, you know, it's all so, and, and I, won't, I won't say just the political situation south of the border, but the entire pandemic and everything. Do you feel like that as a writer that you think like, wow, I couldn't have made this up? Absolutely. I think that as a topic, um, it's, it's just so far reaching. Uh, I think that the, the shock of seeing what has happened and what is happening currently, the, the disbelief of the fact that this thing is here and that it's not going away anytime soon. I think that's the hardest part to deal with. And I think that's the part that creates that uncertainty and that fear is that we are stuck with this for a long time and we're having to handle that process. We've got to process those feelings and there's no end to it. And that's what I like about science fiction is it does bring stuff to an end. So hopefully at some point we can bring this to an end. I personally don't want to write about pandemics when I wrote about a virus in my book in, in, in 2017, I had no idea it would have similar feel to what's going on around at the moment. But yes, definitely not the sort of thing anybody could have predicted. For sure. And I mean, I'm curious, it sort of impacted us all as individuals very differently, individuals and families, depending on our circumstances. But um, as a writer, do, does this give you permission to spend more time or, or maybe perhaps force you to spend more time at the desk? And is this, a, is this a constructive time for you? I mean, I've talked to some writers who say, absolutely not. I can't do anything at this time. Uh, what's it been like for you as a writer? Um, it actually hasn't changed that much. Um, it took a while to kind of get into the rhythm of things like homes, having my son at home to school. Um, and trying to figure out how to work around his time frames that he needed support for his schoolwork and, and that sort of thing. Um, I worked from home before. Since my husband and I came to Canada in 2006, we've had our own business. So we've worked from home the entire time. That part hasn't changed. Um, it took me a while to get back to focusing because there was a lot of distraction. What I found is I had to switch everything off step away from social media, step away from the news, step away from the drama, because that drama is exceedingly distracting. And it was the only way that I could get on with things is to leave it alone, switch my phone onto airplane mode for five, six hours at a time and get on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know it can be, yeah, it's easy to become consumed by it all. And, it and, is, and it really just is about digging deep for that little bit of self-discipline that you need to say, nope, this is where I'm focused right now. And it's a soothing process mm -hmm. to get stuck in and forget about everything else. It's cathartic. Um, that's great, yeah. And I have a, a comment and question here um, from, I think, Michael. So do you think science fiction is popular because it can criticize the present without really criticizing the present because it is set in the future and that this creates a distance for the reader? Um, it can. Um, 
I think that science fiction is used to criticise cultures and societies as they exist at that time. I mean, 1984 was written in 1949, which was at the height probably of the communist era in, in um, the Soviet Union. And there was a big push at that point for that communism to expand beyond Russia. Um, so that commentary at the time, this book would have created a lot of discourse um, bec around the topic of communism. So there's definitely room to discuss those very on point present moment things in, in the safety of science fiction, because you can go into the future or into the past and do the whole thing of looking at it from that point of view, what, what your perspective is um, and, and what the angle is on that story. So yeah, I, I think definitely it's a, it's a good commentary tool. Yeah, for sure. And we've seen Orwell use it um, in other ways as well, right? Well, H.G. Wells as well. Um, I don't know if you've ever read The Time Machine. The, the Time Machine has got some very interesting dystopia versus utopia kind of environments. The, the underground people and the, the above ground people have very different lives. And the, the time traveler realizes they are different offshoots of humanity. Mm -hmm. And they've gone in different directions. One has gone communist and the other one has gone very nihilistic, very self-absorbed and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, there's plenty of commentary. Um, Philip K. Dick has a lot of commentary in his writing. I mean, he's written some great stuff. He wrote The Man in the High Castle, which was a commentary on what would America look like if the Nazis had won. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, definitely. Your question. Um, yeah, and you know, I mean, it was very interesting to hear about the Huxley and Orwell sort of. Um, Absolutely. Can I, and I have a question written down that I don't think it's a fair, I don't even know if it's a fair question and feel free to tell me that's not a fair question. But the question is, who was right? I, I don't know if we can even ask this, but was, was it Huxley or Orwell? Who was right? You know, I think it depends on which side of the ocean you're standing on. I think if you stand in China, you would say Orwell was right. If you stand in America, you would say Huxley is right. If you look at Western culture, I mean, he's absolutely right when he says we're drowned in a sea of irrelevance. You think about social media and just how irrelevant most of it is. It's just chatter. Mm -hmm. But we're drowning in it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then, you know, that captive culture that Orwell talks about is, is very much present in places like North Korea and China currently. Mm -hmm. Their commentary, even though it's almost 100 years to, to 80 years ago, mm -hmm. still applies. It might not apply in the great measure that, I mean, Orwell predicted or he saw the entire Western world becoming communist. Um, but Huxley saw that softening and that, that blissed out, we don't care, nihilism, right. that Western culture has become. Right. Yeah. Netflix to death, right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Binge watching. We have a, we have a question coming in from Facebook um, from yeah. Valerie. So the question is, uh, do you think of how our present day pandemic will be referenced in future literature? So, so this is like looking into the future and saying, how will we talk about this time in literature? Oh, I honestly don't know. Um, I think that there's just so much to wrap your head around currently. And it's still such a changeable environment. <sighs> we haven't even hit the second wave, so to speak, in some places. But, you know, I read something yesterday where they were talking about this thing is going to be with us for the next 10 to 20 years. The same way they haven't eradicated polio, they won't eradicate COVID-19. So I guess in future we'll see the discussion around how it's affected us further down the line. I mean, right now, 
economically it's a shambles. How are we going to get from this point back to economic stability again is, is hard to see. And I think because of that, because the fact that everything is so hard to see right now, I can't really say what, what people are going to write about mm -hmm. if they do write about the pandemic. Mm -hmm. But I certainly hope there are some heroes out there in, in some storylines that are coming together because we need some heroes. We do need some heroes. Um, it's interesting too, I mean, because we are faced with such uncertainty. Um, mm. You've expressed the, you know, the idea that it's very difficult to imagine how we're going to see this. But does this, this level of uncertainty, does this create um, space and importance for the imaginers? Um, I mean, you talked a lot about how science fiction was sort of led the way in terms of imagining what is possible technologically and in other ways. So is there actually a, an enlarged space right now for the imaginers to do their amazing work? I absolutely think so. Um, there's that saying that, mother, that um, necessity is the mother of invention. All right. And if you consider how quickly they are moving through vaccination um, development for COVID-19 in, in various places. Um, not that they're promising anything soon, but a process that normally takes them 10 years has taken them three, four, five, six months tops at this point. They're really pushing hard. They're, they're, they're pushing their limits as far as their science is concerned in developing this vaccination. And I think that there's no doubt in my mind there's going to be breakthroughs when it comes to this sort of thing. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that there are going to be medical breakthroughs that happen because of the way they've got to change the treatments of certain people under certain conditions. Um, I think we need to see a revolution in medical care. I think we need to see a revolution in um, elderly care. And all of that is going to probably generate a lot of thinking around what can we do? What do we see is happening? What can we imagine happening? Wonderful. Yeah, there's a lot of imagining to be done. We oh, have, an, yeah, we have another question coming in from Michael, um, and it's a Star Trek reference. I'll confess to not understanding it, uh, but I'll read it for you, and I'm sure because you're a Trekkie, you'll understand it. So the question is: Are we living in the dark mirror universe? Yes. <laughs> Um, well, I don't know. I mean, you know, you could, you could argue, and I think um, Philip K. Dick was the one that actually argued that we cannot have one single objective reality. Reality is, is splicing off and becoming something different every day. Every decision that's made changes your reality. And one, one decision you make today could have been three different others and that reality could have gone in different directions. So the Star Trek reference I appreciate because yes, mirror, mirror realities, alternate universes, all that sort of thing. I love that stuff. Um, yeah, I kind of sometimes feel like we're living in an episode of one of those shows. And um, somebody said today on Twitter that he ordered a package in June from the Star Trek store and he's he still hasn't received it yet, so he's convinced it's coming from the Delta Quadrant, so, which I had a good laugh about. So. Um, one thing that I have to ask is, you know, we're on the topic of science fiction, and, and a major part of science fiction is science. Mm. I've been surprised personally by how science, I don't know how to put this, but you probably already know what I'm getting at, is that uh, the belief in science is not necessarily um, firm throughout no. the world, right? And, and we're seeing science be undermined, ignored, um, all sorts of things. So, so what's your take on, on that as a science fiction writer, that we're seeing science undermined left, right, and center? A lot of science um, is, is a leap of faith. And if you consider that a lot of religions are also undermined, consider science to be a form of religion. Um, it kind of makes a little bit 
easier to kind of comprehend why people would undermine that because it's difficult to take someone who has a firm belief system and change that. It's better to not argue the point because the more you argue, the more they're going to dig in. Um, I think science fiction provides a foot in the door because it gives them a different point of view, gives them a gentler entry point to some of that science. I mean, I, I would think that a lot of people who are arguing and objecting to the fact of wearing masks are probably people who have favorite sci-fi shows or favorite sci-fi um, brands that they follow. Like there's a lot of Star Wars people out there. So maybe Star Wars is the right way to get to them, you know? Um, so science fiction could definitely soften the blow, I think, and, and make it a little bit easier for them to get on board. Sure, sure. Um, I'd like to switch a little bit and talk about your writing a little bit, if we can. Sure. Um, well, I'm very curious for you, because I know you've written short stories as well. How does a story start? I mean, and maybe it's different for every story, I realize, but what's, what's the, is there a typical seed of a story? Is it a thought experiment, scientific thought experiment? Is it a character? Is it a situation or scene? How do things usually start for you? For me, it's, it's normally around a, a question I can't quite answer in, in one sitting, okay? Uh, I'm, not, I'm sure everybody has these shower thoughts. You have this moment where you think with clarity, what if this thing? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm particularly fascinated with space exploration. Um, the whole Mars exploration that's going on right now, the whole SpaceX drive to get to Mars and so on, really kind of captivated um, me early on. And I've been following that story quite a long time, since, since the early days. My thinking on where I landed with um, my, my books is what about when we've been there for a while? What's it gonna be like when we've been there for a while? Is it going to be science? Is it gonna be a population of people just trying to get on with their lives? That was where the story started for me is trying to imagine what it's like already in place you you come into their world and they've been there for decades and now things are really starting to heat up because earth has lost interest in mars they've got their own stuff going on um, and there's people who want to use that to shift the balance of power and the story picks up from there for my, my two books, Where Mars, Storm at Dawn, and then the third book, um, Break the Dark, kind of brings it all together and it gives you the, the big picture look at why this all happened. Um, for the short stories, some of the stuff that I've done, and, and when I say short stories, most of it's microfiction, and that was actually a challenge because I've only written novels 400 page novels so i was like okay well i've got to challenge myself to think more succinctly and i did those based on prompts that were given on twitter mm. so the very short stories the vss that were run i did some of those for about a year and then um, there was another science fiction anthology that asked for short stories that were 500 words or something of that nature so like a little half page almost and again, it was a case of you've got to open the story, you've got to create the setting and you've got to close it all up in 500 words. That was a challenge. Um, and I felt that, you know, just something different while I was busy working on these heavy books, see if I could do it. So, right. yeah. And so now you're, I mean, you're in the final stages of this final book. Does that mean it's written and you're doing the editing work? It is with my editor currently, yes. So I'm anticipating getting it back from her probably beginning of this, uh, not December, September, September, and then being able to work on finalizing it through September and October for release somewhere towards the end of the year. 
And Maybe you, a little sooner. It just depends on how much she's got in there for me. Sure, sure. Do you enjoy that part of it? I mean, because at that point in the editing phase, I mean, you've done all the imaginative work. You've done all the concept work. You've created all the scenes. You've written all the characters. And then you're just going through the nitty gritty. Do you enjoy that part of it? Or is I don't mind it. Um, I don't mind editing because I, I find it a challenge to try and write it as well as I can. Um, you know, when I first wrote We Are Mars, you know, I did that and I thought I'd done it well. And then I learned some more about writing and then I learned some more and then I did it again with We Are Mars. I did a second round of editing and pr brought out a third edition. Uh, third edition because I switched from Ingram Spark, which is uh, where I was getting my books published to Amazon. So I had to do a second edition for Amazon and then third edition had the, the maps and everything else that I put in the front. So I drew some maps. Oh, nice. And graphics and things to put in the front as a kind of a, almost a commemorative thing. Cause I don't want to have to do that book again. <laughs> But every time I've done one, I've learned and, and the editing I've realized is the biggest part of the job with writing. So it's certainly not the part that you want to complain about that much. Although there are days when I'm like, I can't do this anymore. But I think we all have those days with our job. That is. Yeah. And actually, there's a question coming in, too, about um, looking past even this book that you're editing now and saying, do you have a plan for your next book yet? I have some story ideas that I've fleshed out. Um, there's one that I'm looking at that's a science fiction mystery. Um, and I'm also actually busy with a story that my son has come to me with an idea that he's working on. So I decided we're going to, because he's got to be doing some work. He's 15 years old. It's summer holidays. He would have gone off and done a retail job under different circumstances. Instead, he's working in the business and he chose to write a story. So I'm helping him. I'm co-creating the story with him. And that'll probably be the next project that I actually take to fruition. Um, other than that, nothing really big on the horizon because... I've been busy with these three books now ongoing for almost five years and I think I need a little bit of a little bit of a break. I might do some short stuff. Um, and um, I think I need to do some reading. My reading list is going to kill me if it falls on me. So well, that was actually one of my questions too was was what are you reading these days and how how big is the stack beside you? Uh, well, if it wasn't for the fact that most of it's on here. Uh -huh. It would definitely be taking up the entire set of <laughs> drawers over there, um, stacked to the ceiling. Mostly it's, um, I, I read a lot of independent authors because I'm connected with people all over the place on, on Twitter and Facebook and so on. And um, let's get back to my homepage here quickly. Got some titles here. So on my, on my um, library, actually one of the books that I've, I'm currently busy with is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley because I actually hadn't read it. And when I read these descriptions of it, I thought it's so fascinating. I, I have to try and see what this book is all about. Um, I've got a couple of books that I downloaded during Black History Month. Um, Slay, which is a gamer style book. I thought that sounded very interesting. Um, I've got The Vulture, Donald Westlake's The Spy in the Ointment, <laughs> and uh, a couple of, all of, it's, it's a mix of stuff. It's really a lot of science fiction because I follow a lot of science fiction authors, but there's also some adventure stuff. There's some romance. There's some uh, fantasy. One of the authors that I love on Twitter, her name is Carol Beth Anderson. And she wrote this trilogy and the first book is called The Frost Eater. It's got the most beautiful cover. Mm. And I'm dying to get into these books. I've downloaded the whole lot. Yeah. I'm stuck on this one science fiction book I've been trying to read since February. So I'll get there. 
but I've got work to focus on and that becomes my singular focus. Yeah, it's hard to find the balance, right? It's, or the time for it all. I know there's not enough hours in a day. I know. Yes. Well, there's marketing as well. So it takes up big chunks of time. And today's writer has to do a lot of self-promotion and that's a big part of the job. And that's absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, and on that theme of promotion, I'd love to actually just share um, the URLs to your um, websites here for everyone to see. So um, you can find Cheryl online at wearemars.com and at CherylLawson.net. Uh, so please visit her websites, check out what she does, um, and support uh, other local writers, perhaps some of those that she's mentioned as well. Um, we find it, you know, so important to bring people like Cheryl to the public in, in whatever way we can. Um, as I mentioned at the start, this is all about cool people talking about cool ideas. Um, and I find it a privilege for myself to be able to do this. This is, uh, this is fantastic. So please uh, visit Cheryl's website. Uh, if we were in front of a live audience, I would ask everyone to applaud right now. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm gonna just do it here for you. Um, and I want you to imagine the roar of the crowd. Um, <laughs> I know they're, they're bringing back pro sports and they're actually gonna have canned um, yes, fan, fan noise. So, um, but that was fantastic. And we, I see things coming in on Facebook saying, thank you. Um, what a great presentation and such thoughtful answers during the Q and A. So, so we really appreciate uh, what you've done tonight. Um, Thanks. And we're going to make the material available on the website and all those wonderful things. So thank you so, so much, Cheryl. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed this. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's a great way to spend a Wednesday evening, right? Right. <laughs> And I would like to mention too that um, Kamloops Society for the Written Arts in partnership with the library does other events. We will be doing more author talks. We're hoping to do one every two weeks on Wednesday evenings. Um, on the Wednesday evenings that we don't do author talks, we do silent write, uh, which is an opportunity for writers to come together in each other's company, virtual company, um, and spend some time writing. And then we just sort of debrief and talk about what we've done. So that's fun too. Um, and then in September, and please stay tuned for this, uh, we will be doing a virtual write-a-thon this year. Um, so we haven't really announced this yet, Cheryl, but this is where I first met Cheryl, actually, was at our first write-a-thon in 2019. Um, so unfortunately, we weren't able to do it this spring again um, because of the pandemic, but we've decided in September to, uh, to do a virtual write-a-thon. So I'm hoping that you can join us for that, Cheryl. Oh, absolutely. I'll be there. <laughs> sure. yeah. Thanks. And I think I'll turn it over to Catherine now. Thank you. All right. So just following up on what JP has said, um, although somehow I'm not existing in the video. <laughs> um, so uh, just, yeah, we're really excited to continue offering events with the Kamloops Society for the Written Arts this summer and into the fall. Um, we look forward to participating in the Write-A-Thon as much as we can. Um, in addition, some upcoming library events <clears throat> include, let me see my list here. So yes, yeah, so our next Silent Write, <clears throat> excuse me, so the next Silent Write event is next Wednesday on July 29th, and then on, the, on August 5th, we have the author talk, and that will be local author Dennis DeGuinness, um, who you may have seen before at some of our events. And I've just posted a link to his website in the Facebook chat if you'd like to check him out. Um, some other things coming up are tomorrow at noon, we have our next in the edition, in the, in our next edition in the TNRD Talks series, which will be TNRD Talks Waste Reduction. So we'll have staff from the Thompson Nicola Regional District uh, live here on Facebook and in Zoom to answer your questions about waste management and recycling within the Thompson Nicola Regional District and do a presentation on some recent changes um, and what is new. Uh, then on August 5th in the morning, uh, we have a, another presentation from the Thompson Nicola Invasive Plan Management Committee talking about what are the most prevalent invasive plants in our region and how to avoid them. 
Finally, we've got the Camus Brain Injury Association live here at 6.30 on August 6th, and they'll be sharing with us some basic information about brain injuries, symptoms, causes, and recovery. All right, well, unless anybody has some last minute questions, I think we're gonna wrap things up. So yes, thank you so much, Cheryl, for joining us and being our first virtual author talk. Thanks for uh, it, was it was great to listen to you and great to see you again, JP. And uh, I guess, like I said, if you want to see the recording again, you can watch it on the Thompson Nicola Regional Library Facebook page, the Camden Society for the Red and Arts Facebook page, or on the library's YouTube channel. So we'll see you again soon. Bye. Stay safe and stay engaged. Bye, everybody.